beyond this control, but fortunately, we have uh, Justice A.P. Shah, former Chief Justice of Delhi High Court, former Chief Justice of Madras High Court, to be here, uh, and uh, his views, I have no doubt, will be extremely valuable. C. K. N. Butt, who has uh, written articles about it, which have been published in the very, very uh, the big newspapers in the country, Hindu, etc., etc., and uh, Mr. Sri Rangam, who is here, who is uh, the Bar, Bar Association of India, Bangalore. Uh, Bangalore, from Karnataka, from the Karnataka High Court. Now, Sri Raju Ramchandran, former additional solicitor general of India, is my co-chair, and uh, what we have decided is, though we are starting a little late, we have one and a half hours. And in this one and a half hours, each one of the speakers will take uh, 15 minutes. And uh, I would introduce a subject and express some views, which may be, which are personal to me, my views. And the whole of the summing up will be done by Sri Raju Ramchandran at the end. But no such session will be satisfactory unless we have questions from the floor. And uh, when you ask a question, please uh, give your name, designation, and also the person to whom you are directing it. Because perhaps your question is tailored uh, on the basis of whatever is still spoken by any one of the speakers here. And with this, I commence this session. And uh, let me first of all tell you briefly as to what is the background of this? I have no doubt whatsoever that all of you would have read all the three judgments. The S.P. Gupta case, where primacy was denied to the Chief Justice of India, the SCORA, that is the Supreme Court Advocates on Record Association, where primacy was given to the Chief Justice by reversing S.P. Gupta. And lastly, a presidential reference as a result of some unfortunate events which are taking place where, uh, uh, anyway, I need not go into it, as a result of which the President had to refer the entire issue to the Supreme Court of India. Now, in the presidential reference, Chief Justice Barucha, who started uh, uh, as soon as the case started, he made it very clear that there is no question of going back on SCORA. Therefore, use SCORA as the baseline and tell us as to what further modifications have to be made. And from there was evolved the collegium consisting of the Chief Justice of India and the four judges. Now the big question is, we have seen the Collegium in operation. The Collegium has been operating for a very long number of years. And we have seen the result being persons who are eminently suitable to be on the bench of the High Court being omitted. We have found a very large number of persons who have political party affiliations being also selected. We have found very senior and brilliant judges known first for their integrity, competency, not being selected. All this leaves a bad taste in the mouth. All this would have been good if you would have been able to find the reasons for that recorded by the Collegium. But if the reasons are not there, then you would start suspecting the worst. And it is in this background that I think at a certain stage, it became necessary to have a second look at the judgments which resulted in the Collegium coming into existence. Now, you would know that in no other country in the world is the executive totally excluded 
from the appointment of judges of the higher judiciary. There are cases where the judiciary also is consulted before the appointment is made by the executive. But for the judiciary to appoint themselves is something which we have not seen in any other country. Some countries go to the extent of having the Senate Judiciary Committee holding a public hearing where the judges are cross-examined by mainly the party belonging to the opposition. Because normally the choice of a judge of the Supreme Court of the United States is the choice of the President of the United States. Therefore, whichever is a party to which the President belongs, the opposition uh, would ask questions. And we have the unfortunate case of Clarence Thomas, where his relationship with a former intern who was working in the same office was called in question. That cast a slur on the judges this, from which I don't think he ever recovered. He never asked questions from the bench at any time whatsoever. He was a silent spectator on the bench. Now, that is the other extreme. For is there something which is in between? Now, we have uh, the uh, parliamentary committee where some judges of the Supreme Court were also called as witnesses. I myself was also a witness, but uh, I don't think my OS, I told them about one incident. And uh, let me therefore tell you as to what the judges have said before the parliamentary committee. Now, Justice Bhagavati, P.N. Bhagavati, one of our most eminent judges, he was asked, oh my God, this is not senior. Now, he was asked, no, I'm sorry, my notes uh, are not here. No. He was asked about the collegium. And he answered saying, I never believed that what is happening in the collegium could ever happen. Chief Justice Malimath, who was of the Karnataka High Court and Kerala High Court, he said that this has resulted in aberrations. Justice, your former Chief Justice of India, Ranganath Mishra, also spoke on the same lines. This was what had uh, happened. Therefore, you find that the judiciary has been itself experiencing various aberrations which they did not hesitate to place before the parliamentary committee. And that is how the parliamentary committee had recommended that there should be a judicial appointments commission. I had uh, an experience of a lawyer who was elevated to the Supreme Court of India who had been uh, associated, uh, I had been associated with him for a number of years. I had known him for 40 years. Now, after retirement, he told me that one of the judges came to him and said that, look, so far as this man is concerned, he is brilliant, competent, etc. Now, it's not because he belongs to my own caste, he belongs to my own uh, uh, state that I am recommending him. But what was shocking was he ended up by saying that if you have somebody, please tell me, we will uh, see what can be done. Therefore, this is the sort of thing which has been going on. And if uh, any of you ask me in private, I'll tell you the name of the judge of the Supreme Court who told me that. He didn't tell me that uh, this is in confidence. And uh, therefore, uh, I am free to tell you as to who it is. And you could uh, perhaps uh, ask him also about it. Now, this is the position. And therefore, according to me, the collegium system has outlived the purpose and the high hopes which people had in it. Thereafter, we have this act. And briefly to sum up, I would say so far as this act is concerned, it is necessary. But necessary with this qualification that the majority of the total members should be the judges themselves. Now, which means that the government won't, through a brute, brute majority, be able to push their candidates in, overruling the judges. Secondly, every recommendation should be supported by reasons. Thirdly, every dissent should be recorded and recorded uh, with reasons. 
Fourthly, this should be an open book where anybody can see as to why a judge has been recommended and why a judge has been overlooked for both the High Court as well as the Supreme Court. If this is there, then transparency has been maintained, the objectivity has been maintained, rules have to be framed, uh, setting out as to what would be the criteria. I have any number of books which set out what is the criteria on which judges have to be appointed, and those criteria have to be evolved in rules. Integrity, I think, is a single most important factor. Thereafter comes competency and knowledge, etc., etc. Representation has to be given to different regions, etc., even religions, because that is done all over. And otherwise, you can't concentrate on one part because we are a diverse nation consisting multicultural, multilingual, multireligious. All this has to be provided for. And lastly, according to me, so far as these two eminent members are concerned, they have, uh, they have to be not lawyers. Lawyers, practicing lawyers cannot be the members of the commission because they will recommend somebody, he's on the high court bench, they will appear before the uh, judge and the judge will be grateful to them. Or if uh, they, uh, somebody is elevated to the Supreme Court, he gets an advantage because the judge will uh, know that he has been uh, recommended by this. It should be non-practicing lawyers. Retired, uh, b b b uh, b b law, I mean lawyers who are not practicing or any other uh, uh, eminent jurist would be the ideal. Lastly, I would say that the Prime Minister of India should not be associated with the Chief Justice of India. The Chief Justice of India and, uh, has to keep his distance from the political class. Therefore, so far as the Chief Justice of India is concerned, he should preside in regard to the selection of the eminent uh, uh, persons. The Chief Justice of India, of course, is presiding over the members. I don't agree with, I'm not sure whether uh, my friend uh, Raju Ramchandran is right in saying that the convener will also be a member. The, uh, the bill says that the following shall be the members, then the Secretary Law and Justice will be the convener. Oh, member secretary, therefore, yes, that's right. Yes. Therefore, so far as the convener is concerned, he is outside. Now, if you have four, uh, then according to me, the leader of the opposition has also to be associated with the commission, which means that the outsiders, other than the judges, will be the, uh, the, uh, the law minister, the leader of the opposition, and two eminent persons. But if you have only one eminent person, to have the outside public view on whatever is uh, relevant, then in such a case you have four uh, judges, chief justices and the three senior most. Those four can always overrule the entirety of the others. I think it is essential in the present setup where we have seen as to how the executive wing of the state functions, how the political wing of the state uh, uh, functions. I am not talking about the present uh, uh, current government alone. I'm saying governments across the board. I think it is essential that so far as the judges are concerned, they are in the majority. But whatever they say and do will be recorded. Therefore, these are the overview of what so far as I'm concerned. And with this uh, statement, which is all mine and not to be attributed to the Bar Association of India, I would call upon Justice A.P. Shah to address us. I think that. Mr. Vedukopal, distinguished panelist, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin with some preparatory remarks. It seems that the recent introduction of the Judicial Appointments Commission Bill 2013 by the government for setting up a National Judicial Commission has taken the legal world by surprise. The unexpected timing of announcement and the lack of prior consultation before placing the bill in the parliament has attracted 
considerable criticism, provoking concern that the proposals might be an attempt on the part of the government to take control of the process of judicial appointments. Some members of the bar have criticized the bill by saying that including persons in the commission from outside judicial system would compromise the independence of judi judiciary. There is also a concern that since the composition of commission is defined in section three of the bill and not in the constitutional amendment bill, the composition can be altered by the parliament, by the government, by, through parliament, by simple majority. Frankly, I was not aware of the letter written by the, by the eminent lawyers to Mr. Sibyl, and I was also not aware that it was not replied to, copy of the bill was not supplied. There is a need for wider consultation, there is no doubt about it. But I am really perplexed at the reaction of the bar to this bill for forming National Judicial Commission. There were constant demands by numerous quarters, not limited to uh, the legal fraternity, for setting up a National Judicial Commission. Now the bill has been introduced, but the very same voices, they have they completely shunned the idea of, of National Judicial Commission. I mean, I, may, I understand you may have objection about the composition, you may have objection about the manner of functioning of the Judicial Commission, but surely the National Judicial Commission, formation of this commission was a demand which has been consistently made by, 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 by the legal fraternity as well as the judges. Now, this is not something coming out of the blue. The bill was first introduced in 1990 by Janata government. But that lapsed, unfortunately, and it could not, be, there was no logical conclusion. Then 80th and 121st Law Commission reports had recommended setting up of the National Judicial Commission. Now let me say something about this uh, current system of collegium. The Honorable the Chief Justice of India was kind enough to mention that he was a part of my collegium. I had experience in three collegiums in Bombay High Court, Madras High Court, and thereafter Delhi High Court. And it, 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 it's, 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 I'm giving you the perspective, I, would, I should not say this, but sort of an insider perspective. This decision which has been given by the Supreme Court in 1993, whereby the word consultation was read as concurrence, and the ultimate authority was vested in the Chief Justice of India have drawn sharp criticism not only in India but outside. Justice V. R. Krishnayar termed this as egregious fraud upon the Constitution. The Lord Robin Cook gave a lecture titled Where Angels Fear to Treat. He took this, he was guarded in giving the title. This is from English poet Alexander Pope that, that full line reads, for fools rush in where angels fear to treat. The, and it has been consistently attacked. Mr. Andhyarujana is sitting here. He said that when the judges take the complete control of appointment of judges, then it has a club-like atmosphere. I mean, you see virtues only in the people who are like you. Then Justice Rumapal, a very distinguished judge, she said that the, she made a stinging criticism. This is, she said that because of the secrecy, there is inadequate input, etc. But what she said is very important and which I've seen it personally, that is trade-offs amongst the members of the collegium, which is very common. And the, and the growing culture of psychophancy and, uh, and the lobbying, which is the, it's my experience, let me say this on record, that the most of the chief justices today, they are all the time, they are rather busy in, in inviting the judges of the collegium from the Supreme Court, holding functions from them, and, and really there is hardly any expectation of a judicial work from, the Supreme, uh, from a chief justice of the high court who is in the zone of consideration. 
the brazenness with which the appointments are made is again shocking you can appoint your brother your sister your nephew anybody i mean and then all that you are supposed to do is to say that you have accused yourself in the in the in the uh, in the meeting one chief justice is remarked he recommended his junior so he said that if i don't recommend him who would who would, who is going to recommend this man so this is and and the this continuously this dubious appointments are made and it could stop only when the bar took up the matter the madras high court bar and the punjab and haryana high court bar they took a strong opposition to this recommendations and you must have read in yesterday's indian express that the many of the recommendations were were had to be rejected by the collegium now please mark my words these names were rejected they were undesirable names even in the madras list not because of there is a care, more careful scrutiny it is only because the bar has risen to the occasion and objected to the certain appointments the basically you must understand that that this is a complete misalignment between the present system of judicial appointments and core values of judicial independence and accountability see the today is system is condemned by everyone nobody would support this system except the members of the collegium themselves the it lacks transparency and surely in a democracy i mean it cannot be vested i, I mean in one one branch of government without any accountability let me take you to the theoretical part of the of the rule of law and the system of appointment of the judges see you cannot have the the just follow the text of the constitution in introducing a process of appointment of judges there are certain unwritten unwritten values of constitution unwritten principles of the constitution and they are very important and according to me three three principles are relevant that is separation of powers the rule of law and judicial independence now naturally the fields are different of the government and the legislature executive is in charge of the government and the constitution most of the constitution envisages that the that judge can be removed by the by the process of impeachment by the government judges can be appointed by the executive but in consultation with the with the with the with the judiciary and this is our this is what our constitution says but theory of separation of power does not mean that the judges take upon themselves the power to appoint make appointment to the judiciary now second most important principles about which in the morning i mean uh, mr sorab ji i mean so beautifully described the rule of law i would like to highlight one aspect of rule of law that is it requires judges who are independent of government influence and manipulation therefore power to appoint judges must be